Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of this great country. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they're working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with a rural municipality of West River, Prince Edward Island Councillor, Sean MacArthur. But before we get into today's episode, I just want to take a moment and ask you to do us a favor. Head over to our YouTube channel, if you're not watching it on there right now, and hit the subscribe button. Stay up to date on all of our latest interviews, our special episodes, our other shows as well. Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown, Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. Our mission is to make municipal matters matter again. So with that, I want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you for those who've actually subscribed already. Until then, now, on to the interview. Sean, I want to thank you so much for sitting down today and talking about yourself and the RM of West River. Uh, I want to start with the big question that I start off all my interviews off, so you're no exception to this question. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Sean? Well, my grandfather was an MLA way back in the day under Alec Campbell when he was the premier PEI back in the that would have been the early 60s. Into the late 60s, he was an MLA. And then my father was always involved. And then he moved to Toronto. And when he came home, he became the president of the Liberal Party. So then politics was just part of everyday life. <laughs> and dad oh. was also the mayor of West <laughs> River for almost 40 years. You, you are the very first person that has stumped me on this question because usually everyone's like, oh, I, it's my family, and they don't tell a backstory like that where they actually give, like, I actually have people who are elected to office, so this is already going great for me. <laughs> um, yeah. Sean, I got to ask, though, traditionally, I, I know for myself, I said, whatever my father's doing, I have no interest of doing that whatsoever. Uh, I've heard that story time and time again from people I, in my inner circles. What makes a guy follow in his father's footsteps and run for municipal office in his community and follow his grandfather's uh, uh, footsteps and run for political office? How do I word this? My dad was a great, he's a great man. He, he was an awesome mayor and he's just a great community person. And that was such a, such a good role model, I guess is the word to use. And he was just such a big influence on me and my sister. And, and we just, we've always been involved in politics. And I was the, uh, what was I? I was the VP of finance for the young liberals of PEI. And I was the national whip for one year. And, and it's just a lot of, we were just always so involved in politics and all that stuff. And dad was the mayor for so many years. I just, and did, I always did, wanted to serve. Did you, did you want to serve? I did. I, I always like, I was in cadets for years and then I was in the army and I just, I always liked volunteering and I was always a part of something. And when the chance came up to be a municipal counselor before our community amalgamated, it was just a good opportunity and i took it so what made what made the final decision because you could have chosen any time to run and you could have chosen any election to run but at the end of the day you decided that you were going to put your name forward just recently pre-amalgamation uh, mm -hmm. of uh, the rm of west river so what was going on at that time in your life or even in the community that you said okay this is the time. This is when Sean needs to be at that table, whether it be through the process of amalgamation or through something else. What was it? What was going on that you said now is the time? Well, like I say, the town was amalgamating, and I knew once we amalgamated, we were going to go down to two councillors per amalgamated district or community. Sorry, not district, but and I just I, I thought it was a good time because I knew. I knew some of the older guys were going to be getting out and new blood's always a good thing. And, you know, I'm 40, 45, so it's a good time. And I just felt it was a good time for me to make that jump. Had you seen people like yourself on council prior to that? Because traditionally, and I'm not, I'm painting a broad stroke here, but traditionally 
uh, people in their 40s are, aren't going into municipal governments these days. They're going into provincial or even federal governments. And I'm not trying to be uh, rude or crass there. It's just it's the optics of the game, right? Traditionally, it's municipal politics is where you go to retire and you just go give back to your community after serving 50 years at a company. Did you see people like yourself wanting to step forward? Because you seem like an oddity in that sense that you're a young guy, a new family, uh, uh, you're putting your name forward. Uh, I, I can imagine it was probably re reassuring to yourself that people voted for you as a young guy. Yeah, it was. Uh, no, like now in our like we had our election last year. Um, so we that were amalgamated. The, that, was the pre, that was the post amalgamation election, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. So that was the first election after amalgamation, and we did really well. Like we have myself, and uh, there's a gentleman named Ryan Rogaby, who's another young man. Like he's Ryan would be probably forty. Oh wow! And then Stephen Pollard, who's one of the other counselors. You know, Stephen's probably in the fifty to fifty-two range, probably. Maybe I shouldn't say that out loud. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but He's no, listening like, to this right now and say, I'm going right. to yell at that deputy mayor tomorrow. That's son of a gun. <laughs> but no, like uh, we did pretty well. Like we have some young blood and we like, it's, it's really good. And like, for me, I have no desire to do provincial or federal politics ever. Is it ever. partisan? <laughs> no, not even that. It's just, it's a whole different ball game. How like so? when you're when you're a provincial politician or federal, it's a twenty four seven job. In the way that people are always calling you and they're always contacting you, and it's a different level of expectancy, I guess. And I like municipal because it's it's small. I know my neighbors. I know the people I'm representing, and not that you wouldn't know them provincially, but. You don't know them like you do in a municipal environment. But isn't that a double-edged sword, though? And I, Absolutely. I, I, because you, the decisions you make, they yep. know about. They know the next day, and whether yep. it be in the news, whether it be on Facebook, they know. And you you, you know these you gotta people. you got to wear. Yeah. Have you been able to sort of live with that experience of living oh, with yeah. the choices that you make? Yep. Yep. And I like I, I live with it because I feel that I'm making the right choices. I'm making the best choices for my community. Yeah. Oh well. I, and I again, not that provincial politics isn't that way or anything. I just it's just a different scope. And I like my scope. <laughs> I like my little bubble. <laughs> so you've ran in two elections in the last few years. Once yep. the one pre-amalgamation, one po uh, post-amalgamation. Um, municipalities have probably changed since when your father was on council. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but more importantly, the jurisdictional lines that we're seeing in municipal politics are being blurred with federal and provincial issues, housing, infrastructure, affordability. A lot of municipalities are picking up these issues because they're being downloaded or just people just don't understand in the two elections that you ran, when you were talking to your neighbors, did they understand the jurisdictional purview of what a municipality's roles and responsibilities are compared to a province or even federal? Because when I speak to uh, municipal leaders or I even speak to people I know, I don't. I think there's a, a lack of understanding of what actually a municipality's role and responsibility in our lives are actually meant to do. Yeah, it's it's surprising how many people don't realize there is a municipal government. Like uh, there's like when we were amalgamating, like there was people that didn't even know anything. And we've been doing this for years. They didn't know we were amalgamating. They didn't know who their counselors were. They just they just didn't know. And it, that's, again, like a bit of a double edged sword, like you said before, because it's hard to get people to go like when you have a council meeting like it's rare if we have five people well the fact that you have five people like even if you have five people i think a lot of municipalities would be jealous of that because oh not absolutely some, some municipalities have zero and normally we don't have any wow 
but that's the funny thing because then they'll complain that they don't know about anything and i mean you can lead a horse to water you can't make them drink right is there but, an apathy in the rm what do you mean is there an apathy when it comes to actually engagement because uh I used to work for a municipality in Northern Alberta, and I can tell you that we I was the communications person, and we we would communicate till we were blue in the face. We would do social media. We would do the radio. We would door knock. We would post it up in the Canada Post uh, office, and there would always be those people who say, I didn't hear about it, yep. because they're, they're not looking for it. And I That's hate right. painting a broad stroke, but are the people of West River actually – engaged and wanting to be informed and actually talking to you about the issues that are facing the municipality or even facing themselves because the issues that are facing the municipality may not be the same that are facing them yeah it's like you say it's it's frustrating because that's exactly what happens like when we were amalgamating we hand delivered to every single mailbox a letter stating that we were having a meeting what night it was and i had hundreds of people say that they weren't informed i'm like well i put it in your mailbox i know i did no you didn't okay yeah but that's but then there's the other side of the coin where there's the other 30 percent of the population that's very engaged they know what's going on they they may not go to the meetings and stuff but they talk to counselors and they talk to their neighbors and then those people talk to somebody who ends up talking to a counselor or maybe the cao or something right so it's i would say it's not bad for the most part but again it's one of those frustrating things that i think like you say every municipality runs into you you're relatively a young municipality only being a year old post amalgamation mm -hmm. now you, you're relatively new to the political arena as well you, your father's been it you were sort of partisan with the young liberals as you were saying of pei being behind the council table is a completely different entity in itself. For yourself, what was the biggest eye-opening experience being behind that council table? Both, and I want to say this, both pre-amalgamation and post-amalgamation. So the biggest eye-opener was, like for me, the process. It was surprising how, how as a municipal government you did like you always think that a government does something and you know they don't really involve the people or they just kind of do stuff as they see fit but then when you get there you can't do that it's not just a matter of well this is what i want to do i'm a counselor i'm, I'm going to give your whatever. one vote <laughs> it's right and it's just amazing how how the whole process works and and how just everything. The whole municipal process was so foreign to me. And and even with your dad's in, experience, it was foreign to you? Foreign in the way of how the process works. Now like behind I, the I, scenes. I mean this like, may be the I'm most inappropriate question that I've ever asked on this show because yeah. you never I never want to be uh, did you ask, did you talk to your father about uh going into elected office before you were no, I did absolutely. He he knew like we had talked about it many times over the years, but there was never well, there's never a spot on the council for me for years, but I never really thought of it until amalgamation happened. Cause then it was then I was looking at it as, you know, this is the future of my community and I wanted to be part of it. But after amalgamation. I was so much better at the process of municipality and, and dealing with the public a little better. And, and, you know, I, I coming from cadets in the army and 10 years of construction and I'm the chief elevator inspector for PEI, but I deal with a lot of construction people. So sometimes uh, I'm a little more forward than I should be. <laughs> hey, and that was, that's good. It can be, but it can get you in trouble too. And sometimes I, I can put my foot in my mouth when I first talk to the public and stuff, right? Because sometimes I'm not politically correct, and uh, that doesn't fly well sometimes. <laughs> can we talk about the amalgamation process for a second here? Absolutely. Because you were on the front lines of this, <laughs> and um, 
in any marriage, it's hard to put two houses into one house and make it a whole. But when you have many different organizations coming together and becoming one entity, it's a challenge in itself. Um now, I know you're post the amalgamation process, everything's sort of the dust is settled, but was it challenging to make sure you got it right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And like it was a it was a long process. Like we started in 2016, and then I came on board in 2018, right before I guess kind of we was it a provincial mandated amalgamation or was it a a community led amalgamation? It wasn't provincially mandated, but when they enacted the MGA, the Municipal Government Act, yeah, it stated that each municipality that was a municipality that was incorporated had to have certain things, like they had to have office hours, and they had to have a development officer, and you have to have a CAO, and and as a small community, we don't we don't have a town hall, so we would have had to build one or rent one, and you know, that's now your taxes go up and now you got to hire CAO and all these things. So when we looked at it, like, well, not me, but when my father and the council looked at it in 2016 and the other five municipalities, they all kind of said, listen, like we need to get together and control the narrative and control our community and how we plan and foresee our community going forward. Now, I don't know the details, and I would never want you to break confidentiality, but I can imagine there's probably bumps along the way. Uh, oh, yes. Not, every, not everyone's going to get what they want, and not everyone yep. gets what they want municipally. But looking back a year later, because it's been a year since the amalgamation process happened, are you guys stronger? I think so. Like, I think we're stronger as a municipality. We, we're doing very well. We have our planning bylaw now in effect, so now we can control our own planning um we're we're going to be getting uh, an enforcement officer at some point in time to enforce the bylaws so we're moving forward and that's great as a community like we're everything's everything's going well as a community like you say there's obviously bumps and people that aren't happy and they don't like certain aspects of it but that you can't please everybody that that's impossible so uh, it brings up a good point there that statement that you can't please everyone but you as a municipal councillor have to decide what issues are going to be presented in front of council. You yep. have to, and you have not presented, but spoke about and advocated for. You know, and I know that municipalities do are not flush with cash. They do not have a million no. and millions of dollars. And if, correct me if I'm wrong, but municipalities and PEIs can't run deficits like every other jurisdictions across this province, besides, uh, across right. this country. How do you see yourself in your role as deputy mayor for the RM of West River in ensuring that the individual need is met as well as the municipal need? And to quote Spock, how do you weigh the, the one with the many or the few? So how do you balance the needs of the, uh, the community with the needs of the individual? That is a tough question, Chris. <laughs> but, it's an, but it's an important one because no, you no, absolutely. Yourself, because you absolutely. put yourself in this position, and yep. it's a, you absolutely have to struggle with it every day, every day. No, and it's it's true. Like you have to, when someone brings a problem to you, you have to look at it and deal with that. Like if somebody has a land issue, you have to deal with that land issue for that person or whatever impact it has with neighbors in the community and et cetera. But when it's a broader spectrum, like um, bringing in a dog control bylaw or whatever, I mean, we're not bringing that in, but just as an example, but you have to look at what you're doing. Is it better for everybody or does it only pertain to a certain section? Now, but again, you, maybe that, will... but maybe that section needs that. So you have to it's a tough balancing act. You have to look at it as best you can as the whole and as the small part too, and see how that weighs out with everything. I think. Do you get outside your echo chamber when it comes to making those decisions? Because 
when you go into that council chambers, you have to have an idea how you, you, your residents want you to vote. You yep. have to have an under, understanding of how you believe you should vote, but an open idea, open understanding that your decision may change. So when when I speak to municipal councillors, I ask them, how do you engage with people? How do you engage with people who aren't on your social media pages, who aren't following you on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it or on Facebook? <laughs> Get out there and actually engage with people who don't do social media, who don't do yep. the traditional uh, means of engagement. So that's where, as a municipal councillor, it's good to get out to the little community functions and all that stuff. Cause that's where you're going to see all the people, the, you know, the older people or younger people that aren't on Facebook or whatever they could be. That's where you're going to see those people at the corner store or at Halloween when you're trick or treating, you know, that's in a small community. That's the good thing about a small community is you run into half of your voter base at the store twice a week. Because everybody goes there to buy bread or you run into them at the gas station or you run into them somewhere. The chances of you not running into somebody in your district every day is so small. So that's where I tend to connect with some of the people that I don't have the ability to connect to online. Is it time consuming, though? Because I can imagine and you know that your job is not a full time job. It is not paid as a full-time job, but it is a full-time responsibility. And I say the That's responsibility right. because you you put in as much as you want. If you want to yep. make it a full-time, you can make it a full-time. But you know, and I know, you do not get paid full-time hour. <laughs> it so, is time-consuming, but I love it. Like It's funny you say that. My daughters, whenever I go to anywhere, I'll tell them, like, I'll be back in 25 minutes or half an hour and they'll just look at me and they'll yeah, yeah okay daddy an hour and a half later i'll come home and i'm like oh i'm so sorry i ran into somebody and i got talking they're like of course you did because <laughs> you always do daddy everywhere we go you run into somebody <laughs> so how do you balance that though because i can imagine there's days when you're out with your daughters you just want to be sean and you just want to be a dad to your kids but when someone comes up to you with their issues and that's the only time they're able to speak with you, unfortunately, that means you have to make a decision of saying no to that person or saying no to your kids. Is it is it hard to be about balancing the act of a local municipal leader in a small community like West River? It can be, absolutely. But I, I tend to... Uh... I tend to err on the side of the voter. <laughs> uh, Your kids will not listen to this, right? <laughs> I'm a, I'm a pretty social butterfly that way, so I I tend to side on the side of conversation. <laughs> uh, that's just kind of the way it goes sometimes. But and to be honest, they're my my kids and my wife are pretty awesome with it. They they're used to it. <laughs> I, I want like to say to... Papa oh, granddad's like that so they were pretty used to it whenever they go anywheres with him so <laughs> they had to get used to it with me <laughs> I want to turn to an, the issues now of the RM for a second and oh. I'm going to preface this question by saying this this is a conversation between the deputy mayor of the RM of West River and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy passed at council. This is his opinion and his opinion alone. I'm still going to get emails about this question. <laughs> In your opinion, deputy mayor, at the time of recording this, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the RM of West River today? I would say development and planning. How so? Is our it's contentious. People want to build a house. You may have to tell them no. And when we brought our like when we when we amalgamated, we had to have a planning bylaw. And uh, when we developed it, it took quite a while to develop our bylaw. We're sixteen months, I believe, eighteen months. We had public meetings and we did everything as per the MGA that we had to do. So it took us over a year to make it happen. And 
there was a lot of bumps on the way. A lot of things that people didn't like or wanted changed because, you know, some guys, some certain people want to have open development wherever they want. Some people don't want that. Some people want big lot sizes. Some people want little lot sizes. So when we made our planning bylaw and stuff, we had to figure out what was best for the community and our goal as a community and our vision. Like we want to stay as a rural community, but we don't want to inhibit development either, right? So that was that's probably our biggest thing now is is dealing with planning and development. And because when the province had it, they had different rules than we do, and our rules are more stringent than what the province had, wow. which is good for us. Because How so? It, some of the things that the government, the way they used to do it, was little more lackadaisy like with their lot sizes and stuff like that so like now we have a minimum of one acre lot size and you know anything under four development you don't have to go to a public meeting anything over four you do and it has to be rezoned and all that stuff so that can get contentious with people because as you know it, like people have owned it, land for 30 years and they want to develop it that's great but maybe some of it you can't develop because it's too close to the water or, you know, 25 years ago, there was 30 more feet of shoreline than there is today. So that changes their development too, right? Is NIMBYism alive and well in your community? Do people, do, when you is, go to make, yes. Is NIMBYism? Yeah, not in my backyard. So the people who don't want change, who don't want to see change, they they move oh, into yeah. their community. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh yeah. There's You've lots never... of those, but there's lots of those people, but you know, at the same time, would you say the majority are though, are the, yes, we want to build, we want to develop and we want to grow. Yeah. And... Okay. I think so. I think so. It's kind of, I don't want to offend anybody either, but I think it's more the older generation. That's that way. They tend to be, this is, this is our square block. And, you know, I don't want my block to be a triangle. Right. But you had to understand that too. They've owned that land for 50 years. That's their land. If they want to do something with it, they should be able to do something with it. And absolutely, but you have to do it right and responsibly. At the end of the day, you decide what's responsible or not as the municipal leaders of your community. As a council, you vote on the planning bylaw. You 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 actually implement the planning bylaw. Um, you have to take every issue case by case and you have to use yep. the planning bylaw as a guide and a Bible in some sense to make sure that you're doing this right. But there are times when you can change council direct control. You can look at different ways that the development happens. Um, you're willing to work with developers, right? You're willing to work with Absolutely. people. Say. And, and I just want to make sure that I, I say that because I don't want you to come across like you're cut and dry. Like it's going to be this way or the highway. No, no, absolutely. And, like I think it's every is it every four years, I believe, or maybe even every three, the planning bylaw has to be revisited legally. Like we have to revisit the planning bylaw every so many years. Oh. So that way it's a it's a revolving document. So that way if things change, we can change them in three years to say, listen, we don't want one acre sizes, we want two acre sizes, or we want this, or we want that, or Whatever, right? So that document can be reopened every so many years and changes can be made, which is great. I you, think. You, you've just gone through the amalgamation process. You've imp implemented the planning by uh, the planning bylaw. What does the future look like for the RM now that you've kind of got the two big things out of the way? And I say big things because the planning document is a massive document. The land use bylaw is a massive evolving document and i don't care where you are in this country the smallest community to the largest that thing is the bible when it comes to what council can and can't do yep. what's next on the horizon for the rm next in which way 
like what's 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 what what does the future look like for the RM? Are you looking at uh, more development, more service <laughs> providing? Are you looking at I- introducing new programs into the community to make sure that people who are there have access to programs so they're not going off to Charlottetown or Summerside to get their services? You mean as far as like medical and such like that? Medical, fire, like. Uh, ice rinks because i'm assuming and i and i i apologize if that the sentence that comes out of nowhere but i've never i've been to pi twice in my life i want to get back i'm hoping to get back i want to get to the fpeim conference which is yep. always a mouthful when i say that out loud because it's it fpeim <laughs> uh conference and i want to know in two years time if i come back to you and i say hey sean remember two years ago you said this is what um, in two years i hope that the community gets done what do you hope that the community looks like in two years, five years time, 10 years time? And, and, and it could be anything. What is the pressing issues that you want to get accomplished that if you say next turn, next election, I don't want to run. I've done it. I've gotten it good. I'm happy with where the community is left if I leave. Um, I'm hoping that the community, the the sense of the community hasn't changed a whole lot, that we're still West River, that everybody is still happy to be West River and that, you know, the five communities are still meshing well and everything's going well and the land use is going well. And like, I'm the chair of EMO, emergency measures, which is big for me. Like we had Fiona and that was, man, that was an eye opener. Like our, do our I, warming Do you mind if I ask about that for a second? Oh, absolutely. Um, PEI has gone through a lot in the last few years. And I say that because COVID-19, then you had some fire smoke, and then you had a hurricane. And if I'm not mistaken, you just had one just recently as well after Fiona. Um, you guys are resilient. And I say that with respect and all honesty. You guys seem to like have bounced back every single time you get knocked down. How is the atmosphere on the ground when it comes to the issues of natural disasters in the community? It has changed. I'll tell you that much. Like before Fiona, nobody was really ever really concerned. Like nobody I knew was ever really prepared to lose power for more than five days ever. Cause it's very, very, very rare, even in a big winter storm that you lose power for multiple, multiple days on end. And then Fiona hit and we're all the, the island's flat. There's no power anywhere. There's no phones. We can't use our cell phones. The data's all messed up. It was a big, big, big eye opener for people. And especially like people that are just those kind of people that don't prepare. You know what I mean? Like there's just those yeah. people that that always say not me. And then it hits and then everybody gets a big eye opener is holy crap, like this is this is big. And like we are our, our warming center was open for 22 days. Like that's insane. Uh, on the flip side though, that's when you really know the sense of community after a big natural oh. disaster like that. Can you take me through the process of after that? Because uh, during the 2010 wildfires in Slave Lake, I wasn't there, but my job came out of it. Uh, the community rallied around Slave Lake. like, And I say community as in the country rallied yeah. around. And I know a, a lot of news was made when uh, Fiona hit, when the ice storms hit in the, the Atlantic Maritime Provinces. Um, but on the grounds, you probably saw people go over and above and beyond some oh. of their typical things, right? It was amazing. Like our coordinator for EMO, he's a, at the time he was a woodcutter. So instead of him coming to the hall, I ran the hall and he just spent three weeks cutting wood, 12 hours a day, every day, getting people out of their houses, getting them out of their driveways. It, like that's, that's what people did. Like everybody that had a chainsaw was helping their neighbors. And like when I went to the warming center on the Saturday morning of the hurricane, like I was cutting trees in the road to get to the hall 
and like neighbors were coming out of their house to help me cut limbs and move trees out of the way so I could get down the road. Like that's just, people are amazing. It It is unbelievable to see how good people are when they need to be. Now, the amalgamation process happens and these massive natural disasters uh, incur. You could not probably have prepared for this. What 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 have you put in place, or what is the RM by say you as the royal you as the RM mm-hmm. of West River put into place that every time now that something like this is about to happen, you're better prepared because unless oh, yeah. unless you have learning experiences from the natural disasters, nothing is ever going to change. So what what do you see as the RM's role and responsibility in making sure that if something like this, God forbid, happens next time, you're better prepared for it. Well, like we have our EMO plan in in place now and it's solidified. We have our EMO chart, like we know our coordinators, we know who our people are. We have our volunteers list now and we have a very extensive volunteers list because of Fiona, which was again, a good outcome to a crappy situation. So, you know, like the people came forward and on top of that, like Bonshaw, we own a community center in Bonshaw as well. And we've just finished renovating it. So we put, oh, almost a million dollars into it from federal grants and other such. And now we have two warming centers that both have generators, both have full kitchens. One of them has a full handicap accessible shower. So we have everything we need in two halls at opposite ends of our community to serve the community if there's ever a disaster like that again. Which is what great. Did you, what did you learn about yourself during this time? Because I can imagine you probably had to grow as a municipal leader very quickly during this time as well. It was pretty. Uh, it was pretty amazing to see how far I could push myself when I needed to, like when when I needed to be at the hall. Like when I went there Saturday morning, I never left till Monday evening. So I was there for 30 some hours straight and we had two families that we had to keep there. And one of the families had 10 kids and like, yeah, 10 kids. So it was, you know, it was a big thing. And we were as a community and as counselors and the council itself and our mayor, we were just ecstatic that we could do what we did for as many people as we did. I want to turn to my last subject here because I'm cautious of time here. And I just realized we're almost at the 40 minute mark and I haven't gotten to my favorite topic yet. And it's my favorite because I believe that Canadians should be doing more tourism in our own backyards than going away. I -hmm. think that we have so many undiscovered communities, undiscovered hidden gems in our country that people just don't know about. So when I speak to municipal councillors like yourself, I want to know in the RM of West River, what are some of the hidden gems that tourists should go visit when they're in the community? New Cove Park. That's our municipal park. And it's right on the beach. And it is an absolutely beautiful park. There's little shelters for people to get inside. And it's just an absolutely beautiful park right on the beach. That's our that's our baby. <laughs> but we'll- Okay, that's a park, but what else? What's what? Where do you go in the community to just let it all go and let it all decompress? And no, you can't say your house because everyone wants to say that. Where do you actually go in the community? <laughs> well, like house, in our, right? <laughs> like in our community, it's such a rural community. We don't really have, like, we but don't have must, rain. There, 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 there must be like a like a road that you can just go drive down and just feel like you're reconnecting with yourself. Oh, or... that way, yeah, like park like the road going to the park from my house there's like a little dirt road yeah i love that road i absolutely love that road it's an enclosed covered over road and oh it's just such a cool drive down that road and you're going to the beach so when you come out of the woods the beach is right in front of you and you can see the shore it's just awesome it's the million dollar question time so be prepared yeah. because you get one shot at this and if you don't if you mess it up not my fault. It's all over. <laughs> um, in your opinion, what I'm makes... not getting swatted, am I? <laughs> Go for him now. <laughs> uh, in your opinion, 
what makes the RM of West River such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? It's just such a great town to live in. Everybody's awesome. Like the neighbors are great. Everybody's super friendly. It's just a really, really serene, nice place to live. It's country living, but we're only 15 minutes from Charlottetown. So, you know, you're in the country, but you're 10, 15 minutes from town. So, you know, you're very close to all the necessities you want to do. But when you want to leave the city, you go home to the country and it's it's quiet. You can hear crickets and leaves rustling and your neighbor's lawnmower. I miss that so much. <laughs> I think like that's the best that's the best part of living in West River. It's it's just it's an awesome rural community that is great. Sean There's just no better way to say it. Uh, and I agree. You see, you've painted a great picture. And like I said, I miss that atmosphere of just not being able to hear your neighbors. Not saying my neighbors are bad for those who are listening, but um, I, <laughs> I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and doing this. It's always great to sit down with municipal leaders from across Canada. And I say this with uh, all reverence and all respect. You seem to be doing it for the right reason, man. And I appreciate that because I think we need more people like you at the council table. So thank you so much for stepping up and serving your community. Thank you, Chris. This was awesome. Like this was, I was very excited to do this. It was a, uh, it's a new experience for me. And, uh, and uh, I got big praise from people that did it with you before. And I know, you know, Ryan, and he talked you up pretty big and he said, you need to do it. He said, it's pretty fun. Well, if you know any other municipal leaders from PI, send them my way, okay? Well, like I say, the the mayor, I'm, I, I know the mayor would love to do an interview with you. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in diving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential to our mission of the show. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support as well. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page, conveniently linked in the show notes, or by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content that you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Till next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.